just perfect, I thought, as the storm released sheets of rain over the canopy that spilled onto the walkway. Lightning lit up the sky in a brilliant stitch of fire, followed by a powerful bellow. I was leaning against one of the tapered columns with my shoulder bag anchored over my shoulder. My ride, who swore to me he'd be back after the show, still hadn't returned from his drink run. No phone call, no message. He was probably passed out at home, drunk as a sailor. A very stupid sailor, as undependable as he was. And as much as I wanted to wring his neck right now, I couldn't help but thank him for setting this gig up for me in the first place. If not for the last minute recommendation, Godfrey would have found another disc jockey for his house party. It wasn't a huge gig, but any extra penny helps. But where did that leave me now? Stranded in a rainstorm with a house filled with grad students, too high or drunk to find their own feet, let alone hold a coherent conversation. No soul here was fit to give me a lift. And like hell I'd stay the night at this place. I cautiously peeked at the time on my phone. 1.25 a.m. No, sorry about that, little lady, Godfrey said, floundering out of the doorway. He was wearing a dark plum Willy Wonka's coat. I got your pay right here. Thanks for the show. You really got a knack for this, Sam, wasn't it? You got it. Thanks for booking me, I said, collecting the money and also catching a sweetly bitter whiff of the burnt herbal scent drifting off of him. That's a pleasure, he grinned at me, and then whistled at the flooded walkway. Man, it's really coming down tonight. You still waiting for your ride? Yeah, hopefully they'll be here soon. Well, let me know if you could use a ride. Hell, you could even stay here if you wanted. Tempting as the offer was, the suggestive look that carried it made the offer almost laughable. The sort of way a butcher ogles a salted slab of meat. No thanks, I'm good. I buckled my lips into a dismissive smile. Suit yourself then, he said, and then sauntered back inside where there was warmth. I returned to rain watching. Anybody I could call would be asleep by now. Well, almost everyone. Now I shook the thought immediately. Even if my father did decide to help, his teeth would sink into me so deep, he'd taste the marrow. What are you thinking? No backup plan, no plan B. Why do I always have to save you from yourself, Sam? And sure, that's just what I needed. To hand him the perfect I told you so scenario. He could massage that irritating father bravado with after mom fell into a coma. He sort of did too, in his own way. Only waking up to be a father when it was convenient for him. Bitter thoughts encrusted with raw irritation brushed against my skull at the mere idea. Nah, no thanks. It's not going to happen. I whispered to the precipitation ghosts. Come to think of it, this house wasn't too far from the station on 23rd Street, half a block or so. The subway would save me the expense of calling for an Uber. No doubt it was more of a pain in the ass, but a pain in the ass meant less money out of my pocket. But what was a little wetness anyway? My equipment bag packed in the gig bag. I slipped a bud into my ear unfurled my umbrella and walked through the swelling puddles. The rain pelted my face with a cold mist. I was tired and Fat Lady Misery was beginning to hum a few bars, but I still had the music in my ear and that was all I needed to get by. It wasn't the money that solely drove me here. It was mostly the passion. Once that first track starts, my heart disappears. Regrets? Money troubles, memories, nothing else matters but the music. And there isn't any other feeling in the world. 
like the rush of energy followed by a crowd's euphoric scream as they flail their arms like mental patients. My mind feels like a blowpipe shaping molten glass bubbles into something different, something new. Sometimes I forget to breathe. It's too easy to lose yourself in the harmonic flow vibrating your organs. It didn't take long for me to reach the gleaming wet intersection of Fifth Avenue and Broadway. I crossed the relatively quiet street to reach the northbound entrance to the terminal. Two lamp posts were casting a brilliant glare with green tops and milky white bottoms. A homeless man was curled over a thin sheet of cardboard at the foot of the stairs, taking shelter from the storm. I maneuvered my heavy bag to the shoulder farthest from him. If the man tried anything, he'd get a lovely taste of the mace stowed in my pocket. Lucky for him, he only shifted sleeping positions as I passed by and continued down the mezzanine. I bought a ticket from one of the machines, slipped it into the turnstile gate, and found more stairs. They led me to the boarding area next to the track. The air was permeated with that familiar, damp, guttery, metallic funk. When I was nine, I called them train farts. There was a woman here, too. She was aimlessly walking between the columns, cradling a baby in her arms as she did so. It was sort of an odd look given the time and place. She was wearing an ivory-white puffer jacket with a fur-trimmed hood. Soon enough, a quiet, gliding hum sounded from the tunnel. Out came the piercing. Spotlights followed by the high-pitched electronic whine reverberated off the walls as the train rolled to a stop. The platform doors slid open and were joined by a pre-recorded, strangely melodic voice. Stand clear of the closing doors, please was a note of challenge in the warning, as though the voice was daring you to do the opposite. I wandered inside and sat down in one of the powdery blue bucket seats. The woman followed after and took a seat a few rows in front of me. Her skin was a yellowish color, suggestive of severe jaundice. I leaned back and blew a warm burst of air over my fingers. It was a home stretch now worst part of tonight was behind me. Stand clear of the closing doors, please. The robotic voice chimed again as the doors simultaneously slipped shut. The gliding hum returned, and the underground train pulled forward with a jerk. Within minutes, the music in my ear was replaced by a painful crackling hiss. I pulled out the earbud and popped in the second one, it worked fine for a minute before succumbing to the same static screech. Come on, come on, I moaned. So much for the anesthetic. Some rain probably slipped through my hair and ruined them. From my peripheral vision, I noticed that the woman suddenly stood up from her chair and wandered down the aisle. She was walking with a suspicious slowness. When she was parallel to me, she reseated herself. My eyes instinctively dropped to my phone to avoid an uncomfortable staring contest with the stranger. I then looked up and realized that the woman wasn't taking her eyes off of me. From this close, I could see the unhealthy pastiness of her skin and the gauntness of her features. Her black hair was short, only reaching her gaunt cheeks. Her eyes were green and looked to be struggling to stay open. There was no whiteness in them, only red nets of popped blood vessels surrounding abnormally elongated pupils. It looked like coloboma or cat eye syndrome, an eye condition I read about on the internet once. When she noticed I was now returning the look, her tight lips puckered into a humorless smile. I'm sorry, can I help you with something? I asked. The woman's hourglass-shaped pupils perked at my question. I'm glad you're here, really. The poor thing wasn't going to last much longer. 
Her voice was dull with fatigue, not going to last long at all. Just as I stood up to find a different seat, the woman leaned forward and whispered to the infant in her lap. A few incoherent muffles slipped out. The strange woman then sat up straight and brushed away the covering from her child's face. But it wasn't a child that I saw. No, it was far from it. Its uneven skull resembled a skinless grape with clusters of forked veins branching throughout its thin skin. Its mouth, if it, with a flickering orange glow, the train was entering the tunnel and the dim illumination revealed more details of the surreal scene unfolding before me. The naked doppelganger of myself was now standing only a few feet away its features eerily mirroring mine, except for the unsettling black veins and the twisted tendrils in its eye sockets. The woman, her eyes still fixed on me with a detached intensity, reached out a hand toward the humanoid creature. Come, child, she murmured softly, her voice carrying a strange mix of authority and empathy. It's time to go. The humanoid hesitated for a moment, its gaze flickering between me and the woman before finally taking a tentative step forward. The air seemed to grow colder and a sense of dread settled in the pit of my stomach. I tried to move, to run, to do anything to escape, but my body remained frozen in place, held captive by the invisible force draining the essence of my memories. As the train approached the platform, I braced myself for whatever horrors awaited beyond the doors. The intercom crackled to life once more, announcing the arrival at 14th Street Station. With a sharp jolt, the train screeched to a halt, and the doors slid open with a hiss. I held my breath, waiting for someone, anyone, to step onto the platform and rescue me from this nightmare. But to my horror, the platform was empty, bathed in an eerie silence, broken only by the distant echoes of dripping water. The woman's grip tightened on the humanoid's hand, and together they stepped off the train and vanished into the darkness of the tunnel beyond. And as the doors closed shut, sealing me inside the empty subway car. I couldn't shake the feeling that I had just witnessed something far beyond the realm of human understanding. Echoed behind me, blending with the shrill sound of the train's brakes, my heart pounded in my chest, and adrenaline surged through my veins as I sprinted up the stairs. Each step taking me further away from the nightmare below. I burst through the exit and into the cool night air, my lungs gasping for breath. Raindrops mingled with tears on my cheeks as I stumbled onto the deserted street. The sounds of the city enveloped me, the distant honking of horns, the muffled voices of pedestrians, but none of it could drown out the memory of what I had just experienced. I glanced back at the entrance to the subway station, half expecting to see the woman and the doppelganger emerge from the darkness. But there was nothing, only the empty street stretching out before me. With trembling hands, I fumbled for my phone and dialed the only number I could think of, my father's. It rang once, twice, before he answered with a groggy voice. Hello, he said. Dad, I choked out, my voice trembling. I need, I need help. And as I stood there on that desolate street, the rain falling steadily around me, I knew that whatever had just happened was only the beginning of a nightmare that was far from over. 
The rain continued to fall relentlessly as I huddled under the closed restaurant's canopy, my mind racing too fast to fully comprehend the events that had just unfolded. Unconsciously, my fingers were already curled around my phone, dialing my dad's number. He picked up, and in a panicked mess, I told him everything. He reassured me, telling me to stay where I was. He was coming to get me. But who would believe me after this? Probably nobody. Not the police, not my family, not my friends. Maybe Godfrey had slipped something into my drink before I left. Maybe I'd caught a hallucination from something during the show. What I witnessed on that subway felt so unreal. It had to have been in my imagination. I mean, surely they'd have cameras down there, right? As I sucked in a deep breath, trying to calm my throbbing chest, I scanned the deserted street. Across from me, something caught my eye. It looked like a woman with a baby in her arms. My heart skipped a beat. Was it her? The woman from the subway? My hand tightened around my phone, ready to dial for help once again. But before I could react, the figure disappeared into the shadows, leaving me alone with my thoughts and the relentless drumming of the rain. I shivered, the cold seeping into my bones. What was happening to me? And more importantly, what was lurking in the darkness, just beyond my sight? As I waited for my father to arrive, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something was out there, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. As I huddled beneath the canopy, waiting for rescue, the rain continued to fall. Its rhythm, a haunting backdrop to the chaos swirling in my mind. Every shadow seemed to hold a hidden threat. Every sound, a whisper of the horrors I had witnessed. And yet, amid the uncertainty and fear, there was a glimmer of hope. Hope that my father would soon arrive. Hope that I would find safety and solace in his arms. But as I reflected on the events of that fateful night, I knew that some secrets were too dark to ever fully escape. The memory of the subway, of the woman with the twisted doppelganger, would linger in my mind. A chilling reminder of the thin veil between reality and nightmare. And as the rain continued to fall, washing away the remnants of the storm, I couldn't help but wonder what other terrors lurked in the shadows, waiting to be uncovered. But for now, I clung to the promise of a new day, a fresh start, and the hope that someday, somehow, I would find peace amidst the darkness. As I awaited my father's arrival, I knew that the journey ahead would be fraught with uncertainty and danger but with courage in my heart and the support of my loved ones by my side. I was ready to face whatever horrors awaited me in the night. For in the face of darkness, there is always light. And in the depths of despair, there is always hope. And so, as the rain continued to fall, I braced myself for the unknown, ready to confront the demons that lurked in the shadows, and to emerge stronger, wiser, and more resilient than ever before. The end for now. <laughs>